Okay, great. Let's get going. So with me, I have Robin Miller, a, a name that might, might be familiar to to some folks who, who were either Big Mac people back in the day, or maybe they just played Mist and loved Mist and Riven. Uh, he's the creative mind behind these games. Uh, and uh, today we're, we're looking back at 30 years uh, since his first game, which he he designed uh, with a bit of help from his big brother Rand, still running Cyan, uh, and uh, Robin, have you even seen the manhole in recent years? Um, I have, yeah. I've played it um, now and again. Um, I've um, had a chance to go back on the old platform and play around with it a little bit. Yeah, I don't know when the last time I played it was. It was probably, you know, a couple of years ago. So it's been a while. <laughs> and I and when I did play it, I didn't play it all the way through. I think I played, um, you know, just that little first part of it. I haven't really gotten deep into it, um, you know, for years and years. So mm. it, it's been a, a long time. Yeah, so uh, to to refresh uh, your memory and and maybe let some some of our viewers know uh, about thirty years ago, middle of this month, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you you and Rand went to Hyper Expo, a Hypercard trade show, to right. to reveal the game to the world. Uh, yeah. So how Which I wouldn't have, have known using... it. You wouldn't have known. Sorry, um, go on. Well, I was going to say I wouldn't have known there was an and I wouldn't have remembered the anniversary at all if you mm. hadn't reminded me, <laughs> because you know it's not something I'm I uh, think about very often. It's not just it's not something <laughs> that I I recall. Um, you know, it's easier to remember Mist, and it's easier to remember Riven because there's so many fans of those games that that help us remember the anniversary, but the manhole doesn't have, it doesn't have a cult following. In, and, um, so I just kind of don't really, it doesn't cross my mind very often, but, um, but you, you kind of, um, caused me to remember the anniversary. So. Well, it's a nice, uh, nice perk of, of having just released the book on, on this topic, uh, Mac yeah. gaming, just a few months ago, and it's still fresh in my mind from from the research. And I well, remember... thank you for that too, because that was a one. It's a great book. I loved it, and it was really fun. You know, reading about um, all of the games from that era it brought back a lot of memories. So that was fun. That's good. That's good. Were you? Um, yeah. Were you playing many of the games before uh, before the manhole? I, I know you. you I wasn't with college really at the time. Yeah, I wasn't playing many of the games. I was aware of just like, I was aware of some of the stuff. Um, and, and really it was more than anything, just the nostalgia of the, of those black and white, you know, games and screens. And, you know, that was the world of the Mac back then. That was all there was. And uh, there's a certain aesthetic, um, and a certain beauty of that kind of art and, you know, we don't really have that anymore. You, you, when you have to make do with just two colors, um, there's something that's really nice and special about that. And so it was fun just looking through the book. And I, yeah, I definitely remembered a lot of those. I'd seen those games. I, I was surprised that I actually did remember some of those games, having not played most of them. But um, I, I more than anything, I just really liked looking at the art that was in them. So, hmm. well, we'll we'll talk a, a whole bunch about the the art in the manhole after we boot it up. Um, just before we we do that, uh, someone in the chat here, Clifton Bees, mentioned um, that he imagines a Hypercard Expo would have a number of small adventure game style projects even back then. Uh, do you remember if there were any other 
games on show? No, there wasn't any. Um, and that was actually, I think, why the manhole stood out is um, there was one other game style project. Um, and it was barely a game and it was a children's book style. I mean, it, it was a, it was the same way that ours was a children's book as much as you could call the manhole a children's book. And it was called, I think something like Amanda's stories. Um, yeah. Amanda, I, I, Amanda good enough. Um, yes. Was, okay. Um, the, yeah. I have I, I, um, you have something. I have at least one of them here. Here's wow. Ingo gets out. I think this was, that's it. Oh one. my God. That's it. That's totally. Oh <laughs> that's it. Oh, I yeah, haven't seen that in a long time. That was at the Hyper Expo. Chase after the rabbit. <laughs> so that was okay. it. That was what was there. Oh, now we're in the water. So there was not. <laughs> That's totally it. And, um,. So there was not much visually that was being done with HyperCard at the time. And that was the, this was getting a lot of attention. So, so this was the precursor to our first project. There we go. And we're back home safe and sound. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, huh? And, so uh, there, were, there were a few others that she made, uh, but I, I think that was the first one. Right. This is the one we saw. This is the one. Mm. And this one was actually released. And I don't know how it was released, but when we got to the Hyper Expo, we saw this. It was out. It had distribution of some sort. And we it kind of encouraged us because we felt like, oh, we have something that's as good as this. You know, maybe we can actually get distribution or something. You know, this is... Um, we, who knows? So, um, but that was, what was mostly there was, um, there was a lot of encyclopedic things, which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, like people mm. didn't know what to do with hypercard. Um, uh, um, and so uh, they were putting, take, they were using it for information. And, and like visual information and um i just remember there was a lot a lot of you know birds it would be a stack and there would it would just have all kinds of birds in it and and you know what are you are you going to use something like that you know people i think people mostly just had fun playing with those kinds of products um so that's that's the kind of thing we saw and that were interesting. One of the things I remember that Hyper Expo, which kind of, a couple of things actually, um, Ted Nelson was there and mm -hmm. he was talking about these broader ideas um, and a few people were talking about the ideas that um, one day, you know, all of these individual stacks um, and these uh, links within stacks um, and our individual computers would be linked to everyone's computer. You know, we wouldn't, um, it, we, we wouldn't be isolated uh, with the, with hyper links, but hyperlinks would go, you know, basically we, it would be, now he wasn't talking about something like the web, but there was this idea floating around that we would have something visual and something web-like. And I remember listening to that and kind of shaking my head and thinking, what? Really? Um, hmm. it, it didn't really, I didn't really grasp it at the time. So that was, that was a fascinating thing that it kind of, you know, now we have that. Um, and another thing is, and this was an exciting moment, is um, as we were, we sold out of all of our product that we bought, that we brought with us. And we brought yeah, hundreds um, of copies. 
So for, and, for uh, context, one of the... uh, you guys had um, self-published using Rand's um, consulting company initially. Yes. Right. Uh, yes. Prologue was the name of the company. And so, um, and Bill Atkinson uh, came around to our booth, which was like a really exciting moment. Um, so this and... is Hypercard's creator. Right. Yeah. And so that was like super cool for us. We were, you know, totally stoked because um, we got to meet him. Mm. All right. Well, I guess uh, let's let's jump into the game and and see what memories it brings back for you. And so uh, one of the people who, who saw the game at Hyper Expo was a rep from Activision uh, and you guys got a deal to publish commercially pretty soon afterwards. And mm -hmm. we're playing here the, the initial commercial release. Um, so floppy, floppy disk. I've also got the CD-ROM, which we can boot up later. That was released um, some months later, I think, maybe a year later. Uh, that was that had some extra content in it and um was and i don't remember perhaps the first cd rom game right right yeah and that was something you know that was exciting to be able to get a cd rom game out um so early on so So this is is where it all started, really. I remember you it is. telling me the story of how I, you you sat down for the first time. Rand wanted a a children's book, and you sat down and stared at the blank screen and had to think, mm -hmm. "What do I draw?" And somehow you ended up with a manhole cover. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it was interesting because he sent me HyperCard, which I had no idea really, like you know what hypercard did or what it was and there was no easy way to describe it um it, it's easy in hindsight i think to describe to people now because it's like html or it's like programming a website you know but back then um it it wasn't easy because things like that didn't really exist um so but it's just like the only thing, the only way you could describe it to people was, was saying um, it was a stack of cards, which was really not a very good description. Um, but it did have drawing tools. And so the first thing I did was get out the drawing tools and start drawing. And I drew a manhole uh, cover. And, um, and the idea rand said was uh, hey let's make this children's book and you flip the pages and on every page there'll be little hot spots where there'll be activity or you know wor different words or sounds or whatever it will be and as soon as i drew that manhole cover um i wanted to go down in the manhole um and so it was easy enough to animate um, ta -da, with these mm. not very sophisticated animations, but animations nonetheless. And so at that point, um, um, you know, and you can see it was it was almost became it was almost like a natural evolution when I was, I think it was at this point, like, oh, I, I, there's not really a children's book here. It's like, mm. it's exploration. This is obvious exploration. And yeah. I just we began can go down, to, we can go up. Right. Right. So it was, um, it was really an exploration for me as the creator. Like I didn't know what was happening next. I had no idea what was down in that, um, underneath that manhole and i had no idea what was up that vine but i just began to draw um mm. and that's where it went from here mm. well, let's let's head on up so it was really a kind of a fun process because it was totally 
improvisational. And I got to the top of the vine. It was just like, okay, what am I drawing? I'm drawing a, a world at the top of the vine, uh, a castle in the distance. Um, and, you know, I, I was able to create an entire world uh, making it, making it up by the seat of my pants sort of thing. Yeah. I, I have not seen this in a long time. I did not remember drawing that or I haven't seen it. Mm. And that beckons wow. you once again to follow. Let's go see where that dragon's gone. And here we have a tiny little door. Bottom of a huge tower. I remember in um, in Splunk's your your third game, uh, you click on the click on the torch to make a, a hole appear in the floor, so you can go into a secret room. Mm -hmm. Right. So I would send these, uh, this finished thing to the Rand and he would do the voices and I was, um, um, doing the art. And at this point too, I didn't really understand hypercard, uh, that well, I was like someone, um, you know, um, who had just learned how to paint, but I just I didn't really understand the tools at all. And so he would take my mess cause it was just a, a Royal mess and he then would clean it up. And, and you know, there's backgrounds and hyper cards, there's foregrounds and hyper card. And you know, you had to uh, put everything in the correct order to make it work. And I would send disc floppy disc after, after floppy disc to him. And he, cleaned it up and brought it down to like four floppy disks. I probably sent him like 12 floppy disks full of information. Hmm, it was uh, five disks oh. in the end that you had. Um, oh, was it five? And, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Of course. And so you guys are, you guys are living in different states at this point. You are up in right. Washington and he's in yeah. Texas. Uh, so you're sending things quite a, a fair distance while well, he's, um, He's still working at a bank, right. I believe. Right. So let's go on a boat ride. Mm. It was really quite a novel idea at the time, this idea that you can you can have a no interface really in your in your interactive world. You just click somewhere and you go there or something happens. There there's no verbs that you need to worry about or anything. It's just this mouse cursor of yours is is your entire extension into the world. Yeah, that's that is interesting, and I don't know that. Oh my! There's a tiny boat in my teacup. I don't know that I. Um, you know, I, I think from the from starting with the idea that this was a children's book, and then moving forward from there with with our, um, you know, the fact that we. T both took delight in um, things like books and movies and, um, you know, n not that we don't like video games, um, but I, I wasn't playing a lot of video games or actually any video games. So this, I, I don't know. I, um, we probably, um, when I did this, I was wanting it to feel like a world. And, and without any um, distractions.
without any of the interface distractions. Uh, and I think that's partially it. I, I think it's partially that, um, I'm just trying to really uh, remember back what was going through my mind when I was doing this. And partially it was just like draw, you know, it's me sitting there drawing pictures and exploring a world and not that didn't have anything to do with computers. And, um, and me not being an engineer or somebody who was you were really strongly interested in computers, um, this was the natural way for me to make something, probably. <laughs> it's funny this one you can really hear Rand's voice let me warm it up for you dude oops <laughs> uh, so we have another question from the chat here um this is clifton b yeah. again uh they say i think you said you used to demo your early games at trade shows and you'd have a second laptop for adjusting hotspots when someone clicked somewhere and didn't get a reaction uh this would have been before laptops so interesting oh, yeah but then they say that story uh, <laughs> stuck in my brain, even if I don't remember it correctly. And it's helped me work on my own tools for live editing. Is that something you did with the manhole? Um, well, I don't know that we did that at trade shows. If we did, I don't remember that. Um, we certainly, for any of these games, we would, as we were building them, because HyperCard works this way so well, as we were building them and... Um, <laughs> You know, it was so easy to just test and test and test and watch people play them. And then if someone would click on something and we could tell they wanted it to happen and it wasn't happening, we would just immediately go in and just change the, the hotspots. You know, we would just, um, it was, it was just a hyper card, you know, allowed us to do that with an immediate you know, turn around and then allow the person to go back and continue to play. And we always felt like, well, if that wasn't happening for the player, that was our fault, not the player's fault. So. This is so exciting. Such exciting gameplay. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Rand uh, talking about how uh, he knew you guys were onto something special when he saw that this was capturing the attention of adults at Hyper Expo as well as the kids who mm -hmm. were walking around. Oh, yeah, it really was. And I mean, I first knew that when maybe we were onto something exciting because I did this and I never thought anything would happen with it. And I would send it to Rand and Rand was having sort of a reaction. Like Rand was really excited about it and which encouraged me. And then when we went to the, when we went to hyper expo, our booth was just, you know, jam packed the entire time. Now hyper expo was a small expo. It's not like it was a massive thing. I mean, it was, it was a hall. Um, but, um, our, there was a lot of people at this expo, a lot of small, you know, products, but our booth just, it basically was the hit of the show. And, um, I, it blew our minds and we really felt like, um, 
it kind of just changed our trajectory and uh, we were able to start making games after that. I can't remember how to make this happen, so I might have to move somewhere else. I can't remember either. <laughs> Another question from the chat. Uh, Mr. Binary42 asks, did you draw with a mouse or a tablet? Everything is with a mouse. So this is... Which I'm kind of surprised because I haven't seen it in so long. This looks better than I remembered it. Um, I thought the I thought the manhole looked really awful, and it just looks kind of decent. <laughs> <laughs> I think, especially considering that this was drawn with a mouse, it's kind of incredible that you, you got so much detail and. I'm, I'm, I feel better about Cosmic Osmo. I feel like Cosmic Osmo, after I did this one, I, um, I was more serious. Like, okay, Cosmic Osmo, let's do that one now. And we know it's going to be a commercial product. So I'll spend more time with the drawings. Um, whereas this one, I didn't even know if it would ever, you know, I, I was going to school and I was just sort of playing my way through it. And where on Cosmic Osmo, Rand and I would sit and plan ahead, and you know we knew it was full of activities, and um, we just took a lot more time. It's really quite incredible what uh, some people were doing with a, a mouse and Mac Paint back in those days and the most impressive would have been probably yeah. mark stephen pierce um the stuff he was doing with macromind and then when he uh, made dark castle with silicon beach mm. yeah i i started using like really early on i started using photo photoshop and illustrator um before we did this and um you know it wasn't easy <laughs> to, to use those programs um back in at that early time um and um you know i would look through mac world magazine and see what other people had been doing with um those programs and um it was kind of amazing what people would manage to do Mm. And Macworld in those days would actually have a, a section near the end of the magazine where the, these are things people are drawing with a Macintosh. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Just, just right. pages after yeah. pages of, of drawings. That was that was the whole yes. content mm -hmm. in this section. Yeah. They would have contests and things like that too. It was very cool. It really, Macworld magazine uh, really felt like a... Uh, a, uh, more of a well, it was a smaller community, um, and so it felt um, like it was of uh, the voice of this smaller community back then. Um, so it was a fun magazine. I don't even remember what this room is. Uh, I know I can click on this painting and go into the mountain. <laughs> really? I remember that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I do this. Mm. Wow. Okay. And I think I can close the door and uh, an alien will come or something like that. Wow. Hmm. 
Hmm. Oh, a little copyright infringement there. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> And now, once again, we can get into this this kind of hub. Mm. Mm, now that's open. Okay, so I had to come through to make it open. So would this have been a game that you would have played when you, I mean, what is your connection to a game like this? Uh, I I was too young for this one. Uh, I So I was like a, a year old, two years old, when, <laughs> okay. when this would have been around. <laughs> All uh, right. Oh, I, hurts. <laughs> I played because... I played Cosmic Osmo at some point when I was a kid, uh, and we had Splunks. We we, so that's one of the earlier games that I played. Um, I think that came out in nineteen ninety or ninety one. So I got it when I was like four or five years old. Um, it, some mm. short time after it came out, I guess. Uh, always a little bit of a delay, things getting to Australia. Um, and then. Uh, so I played heaps and heaps of that. I loved that. That introduced me to uh, the idea that science can be really playful. Um, and oh, then cool. uh, at some point during my childhood, I, I encountered Cosmic Osmo, and I, I thought that was delightful too. But I didn't know about the manhole until I was an adult, I think, mm -hmm. um, as I started learning about games history and uh, exploring things on websites like Macintosh Garden, which has all this, you know, this huge archive of old Mac software. Mm. And I thought the manhole was quite charming when I, when I encountered it. Yeah. There was a way out of the teapot. I guess not. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. I think the biggest thing that it, uh, that that's interesting about it is just that this is what happens when somebody, you know, who first of all doesn't want to make games because I didn't when I made this. I I didn't even know I was making a game. Um. Uh, it, this is what happens, uh, and and somebody who doesn't play games, um, they um, just start kind of creating a world and uh, drawing a bunch of pictures and sticking them together and exploring a world while they're creating it. And in a way, I mean, it's this is definitely not a masterpiece by any stretch of the imagination, but. There's something fun about like a little improvised world. And I do wish there were more of the, that kind of thing. Now, any kind of thing like that made today would be a, a lot more sophisticated just because of the tools that are available. But things are so, have such like a, um, 
a purpose of, you know, um, being this kind of game or that kind of game or strategy game or, you know, thus and such kind of game. There's not a lot of um, worlds that are just sort of like, hey, let's let people just wander around, especially kids. And kids love to just wander freely and explore. Um, and um, I think there's like a viable, that's a viable type of thing. Um, and at least I'm not aware of that, a lot of that being out there. Um, so I don't even think Cosmic Osma, Cosmic Osma, we did it a better job of it, but I don't even think we did that great of a job of it in Cosmic Cosmo. I think, you know, with today's like tools and even like with a different, you know, uh, there's just so much that someone could do like a much better job of um, that sort of exploratory world. And um, I'd, I'd like I have, a, for example, I have a six year old. I'd love for her to have more of these more worlds that she could just wander around in. Oh, yes, it's you. Well, make yourself comfortable while I take my nap. <laughs> now, I can't remember how to get here the other way, but I know that if you <laughs> come, come from some other path, uh, you meet him and he takes you down an elevator and, and then yes uh there is an elevator there's also you can look at those pictures have we done that yet there's the yeah you can look at these pictures all... here yes as soon as it lets me i'll pop over to the painting of and, him. and that's yeah that's another thing it's so there's so many like i love this So Walter Walrus the Third, <laughs> presumably his ancestor. would be the boat we're on right now now one of the interesting things is when you hear the voices you'll notice that there's like a they all have this kind of tinny sound and that's because when the game was released obviously the the, the visuals are all black and white you know because of memory um and monitors uh had to be black and white but um the sound also had these memory restrictions um and so it was all like very low i don't know you know what it was exactly i don't know what kind of you know um it was just restricted um and um so, so when rand was recording it he could record it and it would sound you know much higher but we had to fit it all on these floppies and um and there wasn't much room. And so these sounds had to just be kind of uh, squeezed until they just sounded not very good. So that's kind of the reason they they sound like that kind of weird, teeny, gross way. Do you want to look at a little bit of Cosmic Cosmo? Yeah, we can pop into that uh, very soon All if right. you like. Um, somewhere in here. Here we go. That's what I was looking for. Oh, that's right. Oh, yes, of course. Wow. Wh what are you playing this on? Oh, this mini is... Beamer? 
Yeah, this is a oh. way to... Even all of the effects are there. It's amazing. Uh, just recently, yeah. I got the um, opportunity to play with HyperCard again, and um, I was at the... Um, <laughs> I was at the uh, computer museum here in Seattle and you know they have like every computer in the world set up there and um, so I got the opportunity to play on an old Mac and they had paper card on it and um it was interesting because it's like I don't, I haven't forgotten any of the control keys. Um, they're just like second nature. I'm sorry, the number you have reached is not in service. Another little staple of your early games: ability to yeah, make phone you're calls. You're right. You're so right. Hey, let's put in a phone. I know what. Let's put in a phone. It's <laughs> kids will love the phone. <laughs> it's a little treasure hunt. I, I remember from Cosmic Osmo, basically, where you go around each oh, time right. you see a yeah. phone, you you write down the phone number so that when you go to another phone, you can call it. Right. And yeah. See what the the voice transmission is. <laughs> Can, uh... oh okay oh okay it's not converted to yeah i'm using um... a different version of hypercard i guess and so you can leave a little right. message now we have an ink border here <laughs> uh, so another question oh, we'll let the music play Uh, another question from the chat, uh, Clifton Bear. Again. Yeah. Did you map out the paths of the game on paper first, or did things sort of tie together organically as you built the cards? <laughs> I love that. No, it's no mapping out at all. It was all just, just jumping into it, and you know, like I don't know what's in that next room, but I'm just going to go there, just start drawing it. So, like. For example, you know, I drew the desk from the distance. I drew all the stuff and I had no idea what was going to be in the desk. And and it worked that way with every single part of this, you know. Um, it was a completely improvisational world. I mean, even Mist worked that way to a certain extent. Um, in, to some degree. And, and that was more with me. That was with me and Rand. Um um with our visual design where we did certain parts of our visual design um not really knowing what the details would be um and and that would be an example of that would be like uh the ship being embedded into the rock um on stone ship we kind of started with Stone Ship Age, and one of the first things I remember drawing when we did Stone Ship Age is I drew a ship embedded into the rock. Because you have to stop and start somewhere, you know? Hmm. It's like, okay, we have a whole age to, to do. Where do we start with this age? Well, you know, uh, do you start with the puzzles? Do you start with the story? Do you start, you know, there's so many things to start with. Well, I just like drew a ship embedded into a rock. And then, then we can just like start, you know, working through all these other little things. So, mm. <clears throat> uh, 
And I, I'm curious about the the music. So, how were you putting together the the sounds for like the keyboard and these little ditties that are coming up? Um, I don't remember. I honestly have no idea for the the sounds for the keyboard like this. Um, I don't. I mean, th that that sound right there. Is something ran? I mean, he probably. I honestly have no idea how that worked. I drew the keyboard, and I just honestly have no idea what we did <laughs> because Rand would have programmed the keyboard, um, and so he probably just picked one of the hypercard sounds. You know, the built-in mm -hmm. hypercard sounds. I guess I don't know. It might have been something he recorded, or who knows. I'm not going to make a stab at that one. <clears throat> That's a long time ago. <laughs> That's a long time ago. Well, I made something else happen. Yeah. And there's the elevator. Uh-oh. Ooh, looks like the fish was going to eat us. It's an elevator you're going to be stuck in forever. <laughs> what? What happens? It's like I have no idea what these floors are. Oh. What is this place? Okay. Looks like I can only go up. There oh, okay. Go. Here we go. <laughs> Back with him again. No, not the elephant. No. <laughs> okay, I think we've now we've, we've got to have covered the whole thing by now. I <laughs> At this point, we're probably only like covering a... things we already did. Yeah. It's funny because I don't think we were in there before, were we? No. Let's see if this takes us to a familiar place before we okay. bounce out. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I would, so let's, yeah. let's quit this. <laughs> uh, would you like to see the CD-ROM version? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, God, no. Uh, I remember <laughs> when when I last went into it, uh, this is basically the same game with some extra scenes drawn in yeah. and re uh, the dialogue. Oh, really? Yeah. So, I so this was is, never this a this big fan of the CD thing. I was uh, I was never a big fan of the CD-ROM version. I kind of always, honestly, I always felt like it was just being pushed. Like, yeah, I mean, it was one of the very first CD-ROM games, but I just felt like it didn't really need to be a CD-ROM game. No. Like maybe, and, and it wasn't because it was really, was not because we were trying to get it out there, but it kind of, um, our publisher really wanted to get a CD-ROM game out there, and we were happy to get it out there. I mean, it's not like we didn't want it to be out there, <laughs> but, 
But um, it just maybe didn't deserve to be a CD-ROM game at the time. Mm. It, it was one of our early mistakes. I'll say it that way. You know, you make those. Mm. So, uh, on on that note, how do you feel these days about the um, the the redrawn manhole re-release from? Uh, was it tenth anniversary or something like that? The one that's in color. Uh, uh, and it's, yeah, uh, I um, redrawn. I yeah, I know. I don't like it at all. I never. I that was a um. I um from the moment it was you know released, it just sort of like you know it, it, it just didn't feel it, it didn't look and feel right some things are aesthetically not correct for what the thing is and that's what that was and um so um yeah you know Okay, so let's have a, have a quick. That was another lesson. That was another lesson. Oh, how do you feel icon, uh, about? <laughs> you know, when you when you have a company like us, you know, for a while, you kind of learn, go through different lessons. You learn, like, oh, maybe I should do this. Eh, maybe I shouldn't. Or you know, it's kind of um, we kind of rushed through it. I feel. See the animations getting a lot more sophisticated. It's almost smooth now. We used a tool on this one, uh, like a Macro Mind Director, I think it was called. Mm. And so at this point, uh, you guys were you guys were like a proper company. You were. Uh, at some point, pretty early in development, I think you uh, started working together in the same office. Uh, not early in this one. No, at this point, we were not. We were. It was about. We did this. This product came out in two different um, phases. Mm. It came out in Cosmic Osmo, and then it came out Cosmic Osmo and the Worlds Beyond the Macro. So one was a disc version and one was the CD-ROM version. And the CD-ROM version for this one, it was the one that really was a viable CD-ROM project. We like enlarged the world, uh, double the size, and um, you know it was like a massive, massive undertaking. And for that um, large undertaking, that was the one where Rand and I got together. We worked in the same office, and we really you know do dove into what this. Uh, larger thing was going to be. So what you're seeing now is from uh, that first part of the Cosmic Osmo. Okay, now we can shoot some cotton swaps. This might be Maybe the first version. This might be. Or? I don't know that this is the. I don't remember what that is. Um, but I think maybe this is just Cosmic Osmo and not Cosmic Osmo: The Worlds Beyond the Macro. So I. Hmm. My memory is not real. I don't know what this is actually. 
can you press the go button? And I want to see just um, that will tell me which product this is. Okay, this is Cosmic Osmo. So if this were uh, Cosmic Osmo in the worlds beyond the mackerel, there would be um, five or three more buttons where that go button would have appeared underneath or when you had pressed that go button. And again, this is all with the mouse. But you know, um, I was I had improved my ability to learn that tool. But the, these were the drawing tools within HyperCard. Teaching kids gravity here. All right, let's go down. Now I can pick up and move the fruit and keep it suspended in the air. <clears throat> I think this one, uh, much more than the manhole, gets your uh, love of Alice in Wonderland into it. Yeah, definitely. Mm hmm. I had a lot of fun making this one. I, I really enjoyed making this one. I like this place. And making little things, this is just for anybody who's t interested technically and stuff like that. Those are icons that we would go in and I would go in and make in a res edit. Um, so that was like one of the other, the other tools I used at the time was I made a lot of uh, tool or a lot of things in res edit. Anything that was movable. And usually I would go in and draw those things in res edit. But, you know, for Rand and I not being together, we really did talk about all this stuff. Um, you know, we planned all of this stuff. We were, you know, I think he had... Um, But it was still an, I think, an on-the-fly sort of thing. We didn't sat, sit down ahead and plan out. It was more of a, hey, we're here in this room now. What do we put over here? What do we put over here? What do we put over here? Um, um, it was a little bit um, improvisational in that way. Um, you know, it was like, okay, we're at the igloo. <laughs> What should go in the igloo, Rand? <laughs> and 
we would kind of just make it up in that way, you know, um, you know, what, what could we do? What little activity could we put in the igloo? And we would discuss that and then we would come up with ideas. You know, what could a little gag could go in there? Um, and we would discuss what would be possible at the time after we had kind of made those little things. It wasn't like we would design every little thing in the kitchen and then go and make those things. It's Osmo. One of these days, I'm going to go on a diet. This one... No. So this, this little, these little music ditties, I think we changed, I'm not sure, but I think we changed these out for the next version of Osmo and put in actual musical themes. Um, that were recorded. Um, but these little things were, bu were built in hypercard tools. Um, and because this was not our CD-ROM version. Our CD-ROM version, then we actually could record longer pieces of music. <laughs> this was probably the favorite thing that kids enjoyed in the game. Smashing his plates. <laughs> All right, I think I can go down that drain. Yeah. And this is something also that I think, you know, kids get a real kick out of. It's like, oh, I'm this changing scale now. Um, and that's a very Alice in Wonderland sort of. Um, you know, uh, just taking that sort of so this one. Yeah, here we go. It's looking for this room upside down scale. Now we can come yeah, out it's and it gets out. weird. <laughs> right, right. So this uh one of the things you can do is um uh, fly your spaceship here and you'll appear there with a nice look at this planet. You can also get in this boat. And this thing you can navigate all around the map and you got a phone <laughs> of course because you have a phone everywhere <laughs> another phone another phone right and then this is this is this is one of the worst parts of the entire thing even though i like the idea of the boat i like the boat i like the map um kids could not like our interface for this was horrible um mm. he, you knew it because you probably have done it before but yeah first time I tried to do it, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's just so bad. And there's the key. Oh, well, we're getting into like keys and locks and very mist like stuff here. <laughs> you can tell we want to do a video game, can't you? <laughs> yeah, it was um, right after this was released. You guys proposed the Grace summons to Activision, if I remember right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. No. Yeah. And sadly, they said no. We want you to keep making children's games. <laughs> well, 
they had a lot of confidence in us with the whole children children's game thing. So. And, you know, it's probably like I remember specifically them saying no, and I was disappointed, of course. But I also was a little relieved, like, oh, wow, uh, we would have to draw all of these pictures for this very sophisticated game that we had in mind. And uh, how, how would I do that, you know? Because it would not be like drawing these pictures that you're seeing in front of you. It's a, it's going to be a whole different animal, and um, so um, I, I don't think at that point in time we were ready for it. I think it was going to take another couple of years until like the tools were available to us, like uh, the 3D tools, you know, like Stratavision, which is what we used to make Mist. Um, mm. it, it was good. We waited. And, um, it just worked out well. But, uh, so if you turn around here, I think, oh, you can't. Oh, okay. That's on the CD-ROM version. Yep, definitely can't turn. So I do think the CD-ROM version, uh, or I think this version, still has another like couple of planets. Um, and actually, this planet has plenty, has a lot to discover. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is a. Even this floppy floppy disk version is a much more involved game than than the manhole. There's a huge amount to discover, and mm -hmm. once again, everything's interconnected. Even though you've got separate planets, there are pathways between each planet uh, inside of the planets. Yes, you don't necessarily and, have to get and, back in your spaceship. Right, and one of the things that happens when you play this. Um, is when kids play it, especially is they tend to get lost, um, kind of like you're doing now, maybe. And, um, mm. that's kind of what our max looked like when we, when we made the game. Um, and that's his home card. Um, and that's his cosmic card. <laughs> so a little pretty cursive stuff going on there. Um, so was kids quite tend to play in those it. Days. A lot of people were putting that? Macintoshes in. A lot of people in in the eighties were putting a Mac inside <laughs> of their game. <laughs> right, right. So, um, yeah, kids will play this game and they'll just like lose themselves in the game. And I don't know if that's a, a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's, I think it's kind of fun. Um, that they, you know, just will play and play and, and then just not have any idea where they're at. And it takes them a long time of playing a game like Cosmic Gossip, especially the longer, the full version. Um, it takes them a long time to kind of really start to grasp where they're at. Um, now, maybe uh, we could have done a better job of like sort of, of sort of making a center point. The only real center point of this game is the ship. No matter where you're at, you can always know, um, you can always see your ship. If you go outside, you can always um, look up in the air and see your ship and go to it. What did you expect from a blind mouse playing a piano made of Swiss cheese?
Hello, alien. Welcome to planet... Uh, whatever. My name is Osmo. Another teleportation opportunity there. <laughs> now you, you have one shot when this guy passes by. There you go. <laughs> that just keeps looping. I yeah, I think it does. Oh, oh, okay. oh okay. Then there's a <laughs> so yeah. if I shoot that then I guess something else I, yeah I guess on. I don't remember exactly see now you're hooked <laughs> okay let's see what what now ever smaller Uh, we have a, a new question from the chat. Uh, yep. Looking back, are you kind of glad color wasn't uh, such a viable option as it would have taken longer to draw all the assets? Um, in this game, um, I would have enjoyed doing it in color, probably. Um, so, you know, looking back, back i would have enjoyed having color at my disposal um i mean i you know doing it with the patterns there are when you have the patterns you like literally only have um um something like um, you know, 10 or 12 patterns at your disposal. It's nice. It's nice having a limitation. And um, it's like working with black and white imagery. And, you know, that works really well. So, hi, honey. <laughs> so, yeah, um, it's just a very different, it, it's work, you know, it's, it's a totally different type of thing. Hard to answer that one. It's fun working this way. It was really fun working this way with the, with these patterns. And when I was, I, I was mentioning earlier, I think, I was, or at least I started to, that I went to the computer museum here and I started working with the same machine. I opened up HyperCard and I immediately, I started to draw again, and it was. I found it very enjoyable and relaxing to like start to 
do the same kind of drawings. Um, and, um, it's, it's just very, very easy to do. Um, you know, And there's another one of the planets. That's a nice little way to teleport there. <laughs> you are the busiest alien to ever romp around our oh. humble solar system. My daughter just came in and started dancing. Okay, and so now here we have the first uh, occurrence of being able to record your own stuff inside the game. Right, right. Mm -hmm. hmm. So in the next one, in Splunks, you've got... Um, I remember there's a dance sequencer, there's, a, there's another music thing. Right, there's right. We definitely got into tool. more... Right. Mm. Yeah, and Speedlinks, we definitely got in more of the activities, you know. Yeah, we got into like Stamp Animator in the in Speedlinks, which was definitely, you know, a really fun uh, animation tool. I always wanted to see something like Stamp Animator, uh, a little bit more sophisticated, but easy. Um, that would be a great app or something like that. Probably is out there. <laughs> uh, well, I think we've probably seen enough of this one now. Um, All right. Great. So, uh, any other questions people might have in the, in the chat that they'd love to ask Robin about any of these early games or something else? Maybe sneak in a missed question or whatever you like. And, and and Robin, while we wait for that, uh, any, mm -hmm. anything yeah. else reflecting on, on these early games that comes to mind? Um, well, I mean, probably I've already said it, just that, you know, it was the most interesting thing was I never had a... But I, I was never headed in the direction or was never trying to make games. I was, um, you know, going to school, um, getting my anthropology degree, um, I, taking a break from school, uh, because I, I, um, was not a resident of Washington. And, um, and then this just sort of happened in this very bizarre way. And, um, so it was, I had a unique freedom to kind of, uh, do anything I wanted with our very, very first game. And, um, it just freed me up to, um, um, play. And mm -hmm. I am happy I had that because, um, that might be the reason, you know, we ended up making worlds rather than being forced to do a specific genre of game. Um, I was just like fooling around, really. I never expected to make actual games that would sell. Um, instead, I was just, you know, I was going to be going back to school in a few weeks. 
and um, uh, I was really fortunate. I was really lucky, and um, that's just yeah, that's a really amazing thing. And you know, I was very fortunate to have that. Mm. And and you talked earlier about um, wishing that these kinds of playful exploration games would, would would be more prominent today. Have, have you ever thought about going and, and making some more yourself? Yeah, I definitely have. Um, I think they'd be of a different visual style, but um, I, I honestly have thought a lot about it. Um, but I, I, you know, yeah is the short answer. Mm. All right, well, cool. Um, so thank you very much for... Oh, we have a question that's just popped in. Uh, Mr. Binary42 asks, uh, Splunk's included a few 3D models, like the puppet heads. Mm -hmm. uh, was that the mm -hmm. first time you had dabbled in 3D? Yeah, that was the when I... Um... I didn't dabble in 3D for Spelunks. Um, I actually, um, I mean, I did, but I, I had gotten it before then and had was using um, the tool for some other things, just playing around. And then um, I decided to um, um, you know, do some of the stuff because I because it was just so much fun. I just, I decided to use some of the things, um, in with the 3d tool in Spelunks. And I never went with mist. We just never really seriously thought we could use, uh, our 3d tools. And, um, and then it was, we were surprised, delightfully surprised that we were able to do that. So that's, that's how that worked out. But the main place that I used, uh, the three, uh, three D tools in Spelunks was actually the teapot, which then I redrew. If any of you remember the teapot and you might, uh, Richard, um, mm. it was, um, I actually had to redraw it, um, in, 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 using the same sort of gray scale. Um, and um, just to get it in the same general style. So, hey, Opal. Yeah, we can look at the black and white you version of, right of it. Um, okay. So this, this version is black and white only um, because the virtual Mac I'm, I'm on right now doesn't have any color capacity at all. Um, yeah. That, and that's actually the better version because um, that's not necessarily the better version of the game, but that's the version I mean is the first version that came out. Um, I did do a 3D version of the teapot and then to make it match the rest of the game. So let's um, speed through and let's show the teapot. It's a shame you were never able to uh, finish the, the add-on worlds that you guys had been building for this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you can see, you know, this has a little bit of that mist-like feel with the, you know, the little lights out there. I mean, certainly not inside the elevator, but... like the inside of the elevator it's fun okay i think this one's the teapot over here i don't know that's it that's gotta be it yeah there we go so that yeah so that i that was all done with uh, three-dimensional tools then i went back and just using the hypercard drawing tools i redrew it just to you know, give it the same feeling of the hypercard, you know, draw, you know, those, that same 
as if it was drawn with hypercard. It still looks like it was really, like it's really 3D. Mm. And I love this effect of looking like you're going into the world inside the teapot. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Uh, so we've got a number of questions that have come through here. Um, let me skip forward and then I'll go backwards because there's a question that's specifically about this game. Uh, were add-on rooms ever built or only planned? Uh, no, they were just plan. We didn't even plan add-on rooms. We, you know, we didn't sit down and plan anything. We just wanted to do add-on rooms. Um, you know, if this game had been built today those add-on rooms would have been you know content content that um you would buy by pressing you know a button on your iphone or something um but that didn't exist back then <laughs> so um you would have had to like it, it was just too much for people to do you would have had to go to the store and buy a, a box to get this add-on rooms and um and I think in the meantime, both Rand and I have discovered that we are not crazy fans about that kind of, you know, purchased add-on content anyway. But, um, but yeah, those add-on rooms, those additional rooms were, um, were something that we never really planned, but we would have if the original, just the original three rooms had really gotten much of a following and they really didn't. Hmm. I think the reason, part of the reason they didn't get much of a following is we, um, we sold this ourselves. We sold Spelunks ourselves. And, um, even though Broderbund helped us distribute it and we didn't do a very good job, um, in marketing it. Um, and so it, not many people heard about it. Um, and that was, you know, it just, the, the word didn't really ever get out. And so we did do a color version after this. And I think even fewer people heard about that one, you know. I think this version has uh, little spots of color. If you have a color Mac, uh, a few objects mm -hmm. will be colorized mm -hmm. and everything else will be black and white, which was a really interesting effect, I thought. Yeah. There's another thing, another problem, inherent problem that Speedlunks has, I believe, and that's it's a little claustrophobic. Um, the whole game, especially for kids, the whole game takes place underground in these caves and then at the end of the tunnels are rooms and you never get outside. I mean, right now we're outside kind of, but it's a dark forest. And so for a child, especially this is just a design problem. Um, it is not a place that is super inviting, um, to wander around in. And, um, we kind of, at this point in our development as game creators, we should have known better. So, um, I, um, that might have been a reason why people were slow to embrace it. And I believe that, you know, we, um, we definitely, um, when we made mist, we went the other direction. You know, we really wanted to create a world that was all out outdoors and, um, where you enjoyed the open air. Hmm. I remember, uh, what really appealed to me about this was probably the, the playfulness of, of all the little, uh, toys that are in the world. Um, Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I was, absolutely. I was a curious kid. I was into science, so it was great to play around with all these things and learn about mm -hmm. lightning and uh, 
play with the art tools. I think I, I kept a diary for a little while in the, the journal that you can access. Um, sadly, that whatever I wrote in there is long gone. I'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I figure I probably wrote a few little tiny micro stories, but I don't know. I I played with it a few <laughs> times, uh, but I've I've still got the floppy disks that we had that they don't even work anymore. So, no idea. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. I mean, this was it had a lot of fun, you know, little, just like all of the activities. It had so many little activities all thrown together in one thing, you know, and that was really cool about it. Um, and we thought people would enjoy it, but I think at least people, there was just, a, it had a lot of things maybe just that, that were not going in its favor. I mean, another thing is people think, from us expected these worlds uh, that you would wander around in. And, um, and that's not what this was either. Um, so this is cool. This was, this was a fun, this is the stamp animator. And um, <laughs> so this allowed kids to very, fairly easily make little animations just by dragging these little tiles or stamps around the screen. And you could also then add sounds along with it. And you would save them onto little RAM disks. <laughs> and you can see the RAM disks. Down in you the could, things, yep. Yes, you put the RAM disks in and you could have, I think, well, four RAM disks and save up to four little animations. Is quite long. Yeah, somebody went to a lot of trouble. <laughs> Probably Rand. It looks like I think this is one of Rand's. This is the probably the demo. Um, yeah, I clicked on the demo button. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got all these. So there was a number of pre-made, uh, yeah, pre-made stamps. Like little emojis. <laughs> Ahead of your time. Yes. And those were the ones yeah, you yeah, could use the kind of make him run. So. Okay. Um, try and catch up on some of the questions we got here in the chat. Um, Miles Jacob asks. Um, about your music composition process. They've been mourning Opcode Music Shop for 20 years now. And I didn't hear the last part of that. They've been, um, what was that? Mourning Opcode <laughs> Music Shop. Uh, some Up kind of code. music. I don't music know what that shop. is. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with it either. Apparently it's been uh, dead for a good 20 years. Yeah, I don't know what There's, that is. So I haven't been mourning that because I, I, I don't know what it is. But um, my process is, is usually starts with um, if I'm writing for something visual like uh, film or video game, I put it up on the screen in front of me. I sit at the piano and by the piano, I mean um, a keyboard with piano sound Um and I will use that piano sound and I begin to play what I am trying, what I feel. And I think I like the piano sound because that's what I, I learned on. And I record myself um, just like playing and trying as much in po as possible to just like, you know, directly feel what I'm seeing if that makes any sense. And um, I'll do that. I'll just like play and play and play. And um, I'll then just go back and listen to it and see if anything has, you know, makes sense there. Um, um, and if it 
does or when it finally does, I'll, I'll take those pieces and I, um, put it together um, and I'll, I'll start going back through and I'll start replacing it with different instruments. And, um, I usually, um, replace it first with either bass, um, and I leave the piano there and I'm probably giving too much information at this point, but I replace it with bass and, um, and then I start putting down different instruments one at a time. And then at some point or another, I, I get rid of the, the, the piano if I need to. And so that's kind of roughly my process. Is the, software that you use changed much over the years to, to help you with yeah, this process? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, what I first use, like for example, on the Miss soundtrack, I was using, uh, just some, um, uh, like I was using a Proteus MPS plus as a keyboard. And on that I did, all of the sounds i did the mixing i did all of my effects i did everything and the only thing i used my software for um on the mac was um at midi um arranging and uh midi recording basically but everything else like took place on the external hardware um Whereas now I do it all on software. I do all software synths and um, I use Logic Pro and Native Instruments synths and other synths. And um, I um, am, I love the fact that I don't have to use external hardware. Um, so, yeah, that's how I. I've kind of like, you know, transferred everything over that to that direction. <clears throat> okay. Um, some more questions. Uh, cat connoisseur asked, uh, are there <laughs> any nods or Easter eggs from the manhole or cosmic Osmo in Mr. Riven? Uh, the spaceship's uh -huh. kind of a reference to cosmic Osmo. I thought, Oh, okay. Okay, are there any Easter eggs? Okay, the spaceship in... in mm, there is an Easter egg, kind of. It's not so much an Easter egg as it is a nod. Um, in the manhole, or I mean in Cosmic Osmo, there is Professor Osmostein plays a little game with the player. And the game is um, this, like, th there's these two sticks that go vertically and two little creatures climb up and down. One represents his character and one represents the player's character. And you try to beat him to the top of this pole. And um, we made that game just, you know, specifically for this electronics room. You're there in the room with him. Um, and when we got to Riven, we needed to teach the player the number system, the Rivenese number system. Um, and um, we needed to create, a, there was a schoolroom, and we thought, well, let's, you know, a, a game would be a good way to do this. And we realized we already had a great, fun game, and we used the game from uh, Cosmic Osmo. And so that's the it's kind of almost the same game with some um, tiny um, interface differences that make it a little easier. Uh, same person asks, uh, said that Riven is their favorite Mist soundtrack. Uh, and asked, are there any unreleased tracks that you could put out for the 25th anniversary? <laughs> um, 
potentially, I am working on a uh, man, uh, missed 25th anniversary right now. Um, and it will be uh, an LP release. Um, and I, I don't have any. Um, there'll be... I'm sure for the Riven 25th anniversary, there'll be something special that we do that will be, um, there, there may be unreleased tracks that I never did. I'll have to go looking, you know, I'll have to go searching. Um, hmm. those kinds of things are, I, I, I always run across them and I always think, um, I always think they don't exist and then I find them and I'm surprised I have them. So, you know, when the 20, is it 25 years for Riven? No, it's 25 years for Mist. So when I'm running a custom, I'm always surprised. Hmm. All right. Next one we have uh, from Wrapped 007 r uh, they say, I loved Hypercard as a kid and I remember using scripts to animate things uh, paused the interaction. Do you remember how you accomplished both simultaneously? Was it the on idle handler? That's kind and, of and these are it's probably better for Rand. And these are scripts for pausing interaction. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I I definitely remember the on idle, but I don't. I don't know. Hmm. You were the artist and designer. Rand was really doing the, the scripting. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, I'll tell you this, though. What was cool about HyperCard is when I first started using it, I didn't know anything about scripting. And it, it kind of sucked me in. And um, I slowly started learning. And, you know, over time, I got really into the scripting end of things. I never actually scripted. I didn't never trusted I, I would say neither. Uh, no one trusted me to do any scripting for the products, but um, <laughs> but um, I had fun, um, you know, doing scripting for my own little projects, and um, it that was like a real. I, I would consider that that was a a real fun accomplishment for myself. You know, from a private accomplishment for myself is like. Um, being able to script with, the, you know, I would have never thought I could have done that before, but the way it, 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 it kind of, um, it, it, it was sneaky that way, you know? Um, and it was a, it was very easy. It was an easy scripting language. Um, I, I watched my five-year-old start to use hypercard and, um, play with programming little things at five just by, you know, pressing buttons and, you know, linking card to card and then start to do the same exact thing, um, getting into scripting a little bit. And it was the same, it was the only reason that now today he's a programmer. Um, like that's what he does for a living is because of using hypercard at a very young age. And, so, um, and it's the reason why HyperCard was in every school in, in America, or so many of them at least. Um, it, it was a wonderful tool for um, uh, just sort of teaching kids and pulling kids into that whole world. There's a lot of other great tools. Yeah, and, uh, there's some. There's a little bit of chat in the in the stream here uh, about. People were talking about how um, hypercard stacks are great for uh, teaching um, computer science or geometry, algebra. Uh, lots and lots of teachers yeah. would would use hypercard. Yes, right, right. Uh, one person was lucky enough to be able to play Myst and other games in class as part of their computer science education. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, that that same person actually, uh, the Mishigami, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, uh, 
um, asked if you remember the Forbidden Secrets from Beyond Hypercard stack that you guys put out. Yes, I do. I do. <laughs> I am shocked that whoever that is remembers that. Um, that was like Mac User Magazine, I think. That's... I think that's Mac user magazine. It's an article that we either helped write or it's an article that we wrote. I, I, I mean, my memory may be really wrong on this, but I think Rand and I, uh, uh, wrote a, a stack and it was, um, a, like a group of, you know, tricks and, and things to do with HyperCard. Um, and then we published that along with, you know, with our, uh, kind of a, a small article for Mac User Magazine. And we named it Forbidden Secrets from Beyond HyperCard. And we did little illustrations. And one of them was an animation trick. And that was something, for example, that I came up with. And that shows you how um, I, even me, <laughs> a non-programmer, how I was able to like wrap my head around um, programming things or scripting things in HyperCard. Um, and it was fun. I was like really loved it. But unless I'm totally not right, unless this is like, you know, forbidden secrets from beyond hypercard is something else completely. Yeah, that was actually really fun to, to do that. Um, Yeah, I think we should probably um, wrap it up shortly. Um, All right. Been going for a while here. Good. Okay. <laughs> it's been it's been okay. a pleasure to hang out with you these past couple of hours, playing your old games. All right. Nice calendar. Yeah, this has been. Yeah, I here it is. The... Forbidden secrets from behind. Forbidden Overcome. secrets is someone saying it's it's online on the Internet Archive or somewhere else. Um, someone rescued a few thousand stacks and put them online. Here it is. Wow. Oh my God, that's crazy. That is nuts. Yeah, we actually, uh, Rand and I also did a couple other uh, stacks, um, and we um, sold, tried to get them going, tried to get them sold, and just sort of fun things. And so those are lost to history. I thought this was lost to history. It's just like, it's crazy that this is even out there. Wild. Totally crazy. It's fun that it's, you know, around. 
All right. Well, thank you for this. This is a lot of fun. Brings back a lot of memories. Very fun. So thanks. Yeah, it was great. Really great to to learn some more details and to 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 see what things this uh, this sparks in your memories. Just looking and hearing the games again. Yeah. And I hope that yeah. uh, anyone who who wasn't already familiar with the games has uh, learned to learned a bit about what made them special. And those who were, I hope you've learned some new details. Um, if anyone wants to learn other things about um, about the early days of Cyan, there's a fairly substantial chapter in my book, The Secret History of Mac Gaming. Um, and there are other tidbits about mist floating around and all sorts of different things on articles online. There are other books. Um, if you want to play the games, um, Internet Archive has some has a lot of this stuff online. I'm not sure if they have this one. I'm pretty sure I've seen the manhole on there. Uh, you can play it right inside your browser. You can go on. You can go on Steam and you can buy this old collection if you have a PC. I think they have the original three games uh, available. I'd have to check that. They have at least something on there. Yeah, uh, I think they do. Yeah. yeah and, uh, so you can follow Robin on, on Twitter at, at Tinselman if you if you want to hear what he has to say about things. Uh, you can follow me at MossRC. Um, anything else, Robin? No, this has been wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for showing up, and, and I pre really appreciate this. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks to the chat for hanging out with us. Uh, this I'll get exported to YouTube and uh, get highlights made in Twitch so that you know, people can come and watch it again or watch it for the first time at their leisure. Um, chat says thanks to you for coming along and thanks everyone for hanging out with us this has cool. been great all right let's wrap it up there yeah thanks <laughs>